Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to 49 North Wrestling Live, the debut edition. I'm here with Tanya Verbeek and Lee Vering. Uh, we're going to discuss some topics today about our national team program. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the, the broadcast, you can see my <laughs> Twitter handle there right under my name. Feel free to, to tweet, and we'll try to get to your questions. Uh, to start, we'll just have uh, my guests introduce themselves. We'll start with Tanya. Hey, everyone. My name is Tanya Verbeek. Um, my new job entails uh, t I'm talent ID coach for Canada Wrestling. And um, so it's good to be here and um, be a part of this conversation. Um, just uh, recently was hired in May for this job, and it's a four-year contract. All right, and Lee? Hi, everyone. Uh, Lee Verling here. I am actually the reason uh, this was all delayed. Uh, I could not get my Apple computer to sign on, so I went and dug out my PC, which my kids have in their bedroom, and uh, it's a good thing we didn't start on time because I was swearing prof profusely, but I apologize, and I'm really excited to be here um, and talk about uh, our program moving forward into 2014 season. All right, perfect. Uh, to start off, uh, just maybe to recap the uh, year that was 2013, uh, obviously a pretty big year for wrestling uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, if we could maybe just get your thoughts on, uh, first of all, Canada's performances internationally and maybe what Canada did to help save Olympic wrestling. You want to go, Tanya? No, you go ahead, Lee. You okay. start it off. Well, it was a, it was a very um, hectic year, to say the least, uh, 2013. You know, in February, the announcement came, uh, the dropping of wrestling from the IOC program. I know a lot of people on here will already know this background. Um, but, uh, oh, please, sorry. Um, sorry, my daughter just walked in. Uh, we, uh, we did a lot of lobbying, um, ran some great events, and, and the long and short of it is, uh, in September, we were um, reinstated to the Olympic program provisionally for 2020 and 2024. Um, I think there are a ton of huge lessons that we learned in this last year, and um, I'm hoping we're going to carry them forward as a sport um, uh, into the next uh, three quadrennials anyways. And uh, Canada had a big part to do with this whole lobby. We had Carol Wynn and uh, Daniel Igali, uh two of five people, which is amazing, that actually presented to the IOC and they did a fantastic job. And um, it was actually one of those moments in time where I guess your sport gets defined. So I was, I was quite happy to be involved in, in the way we did it. And there were a lot of Canadians in Canada who, uh, who stepped up and, and put a lot of effort in our, our own committee. I'll just say really quickly, uh, Don Ryan, um, we had Guy Nefronet, our uh, media guy, Tamara Medwitsky, um, Bill Hogarth, myself, Carol. Uh, we tried to do everything we could to to talk to our IOC members, the Canadian Olympic Committee, and, and make sure that things went our way, and, and luckily they did. Perfect. Um, Any thoughts on that, Tonya? I uh, just maybe um, comment that um, even though, like, you know, we were really shocked and um, it was a stressful year for most of us um, in the wrestling community, you definitely felt like people were behind you, regardless if they're involved in wrestling or not. And um, I just think that it ended up being a positive um, situation for us and a and, uh, challenge that we faced. And I think that our sport is moving um, into the right direction. And I like the new rules. I like some of the things that have happened because of this um, announcement. Um, I mean, I know it's not perfect, but it's, um, I'm excited um, for the future of our sport. And, and I hope that we can still continue um, being able to grow and, and uh, work towards um, being better all the time. Awesome, thanks. And actually, just to start off, we do have uh, one question that we'll, uh, we'll do first off. Uh, for Tanya, just talent ID coach, it's a new position with Kawa. Um, we just have a question exactly what your, your role is in Canada Wrestling, mm -hmm. uh, what the job entails. If you could just explain that to the viewers. Yeah, so it is a brand new position and how with that being said, um, you know, it's working towards understanding how we're going to um, fit this into um, 
our organization the best we can. And right now, um, this past year, it's it's ironing out those kinks and, and finding a way to know how we can um, make sure we are identifying athletes um, leading to high performance and, and what does that mean. And um, so I'm looking at the cadet program, the field cadet program, the junior um, program, and I'm also involved in, in uh, the senior um, programs as well. Um, you know, getting international exposure, trying to develop a program and programs to um, better our athletes to lead to the um, high performance and, and to um, the podium. So it's very small um, targeted group that we are looking um, to narrow um, in to our, our uh, programs and um, finding a way to make sure that they have everything they, they can in order to perform at the international level. Um, we're also looking at what does uh, to, like what entails like a, a a wrestler that that can be on the podium, and so we're looking at um, different um, um, areas that uh, what a good wrestler um, is about, and and that it, we're looking at um, the, obviously the physical potential, um, the the mental. Um, Training component, and if they have what it takes, um, you know, to to be at a high performance um, in high performance situations, and um, if they have the support, um, you know, there's so many areas that we're looking at to help focus in on on what is important for these these athletes. Excellent, thank you. Uh, that's actually a pretty good segue too, because another uh, viewer question we had uh, relates to. Mandatory high performance camps and, and training. So I know uh, last year was the first ever TOPS Summit. Uh, I was wondering maybe if Lee, if you could explain what TOPS is, what it's looking to do. Okay, for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll say, first of all, even before I go uh, into that, I want to say that uh, um, there's a lot of things that are needed to be a high performing performer on an international level. And uh, our budget, uh, through our high performance budget, is split into three areas. One is technical leadership, which goes into coaching and support of training centers and whatnot, and that's where uh, I think we've done a really good job. And last year, we hired uh, both Gia Sasuri and Tanya Verbeek as new coaches in our program. Between the two of them, they've got you know storied international success. That's one big thing that uh, On the Podium wants to see: is strong technical leadership. The other thing is your actual high performance program. And that encompasses your competition, your training opportunities for your national team athletes. And finally, there's a, a sport med science um, budget that's allotted. And obviously, in a sport like wrestling that's combative, there's a lot of importance that, that happens to this. Go, going into the Olympic Games, I can tell you in 2020, or 2012, um, you know, the medical uh, and health status of our athletes really was crucial. So we needed to have great sport med and sport science support. And so um, that is basically uh, the major focus of TOPS um, camp. We've tried to do it. There's a lot of things that are mandated to us. We have to do an anti-doping uh, educational seminar annually with all of our card athletes and national team athletes that are going to represent us abroad. And there's a, a number of other things that are being asked of us. When we step into a meeting with on the podium, they're asking us as a weight class sport what we're doing uh, on the nutrition side of things to make sure our athletes are following solid nutritional practices in a you know in a class, in a sport where you know um, losing weight and performing is is a norm they're also asking about sports psychology they're asking about strength and conditioning so we know all these things have a huge factor so last year's tops uh, I, I'm happy to say was uh, a chance of, to get a lot of the information out there to our athletes on different levels uh, recovery and regeneration. We did some um, actual uh, physical testing, which are going to be key markers, like Tanya said. Uh, if we test all of our national team athletes and we start to find correlations before between their physical performances, we know what to look for in the, the future generations coming up. So um, it, it's just about running a professional program. We In the past, we've tried to do this in conjunction with actual training camps. And our athletes are on the mat twice a day, and then to ask them to sit in and really be in, engaged uh, at uh, learning about uh, you know um, the science and the sports man part of it. And let's let's be clear: we're not a winter sport. 
where we have bobsleighs and all these other things that are very highly technical things, but there is a lot of sports science that our sport can utilize and benefit, which includes you know digital scouting, it includes uh, strength and conditioning, it includes nutrition, it includes sports psychology. So we're trying to make sure that we're covering those things with our athletes in a really comprehensive, effective manner, and that's what Top's about. The athletes that attended last year did a, a, a survey at the end, um, talking about all the sessions and what they found beneficial, and uh, basically it was very overwhelming positive from the, the athletes that, that uh, well, all the athletes were mandated to fill it out, so it was very good feedback, so I think it's an important element of our program moving forward. Perfect, and then in that regard as well, is there currently plans for more um, actual on-mat training camps as well? Because I know usually Canada Cup was always a mandatory camp. Um, last year we even saw the Nordhagen camp. A lot of Canada's women were out there for that. Um, what Can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on where that's going as well? Okay, well I can talk uh, from it um, on the women's side currently, and uh, and I know I can speak somewhat for Gia. Gia's, and I'll apologize for Gia, he is actually at one of those training camps right now down in Cuba with a number of our men. So uh, these are the, kind of one of the crucial experiences we know uh, are necessary. Last year alone, we had uh, half a dozen different training camps for our women. Uh, we, we were in Spain. We were in Poland. We had one in Niagara Falls. Uh, we had the Nordhagen. Uh, we were down in the U.S. So uh, it, we've had a number. It's a really important element of our, our program to have on-mat camps and where possible to have top international countries that we can that we can benefit and learn from, as well as mixing our best athletes with some of our up-and-comers. So it's always been a mandate uh, of our program. Um, finances uh, and, finance and funding somewhat dictates uh, the amount of times we're, allowed, we're able to do this on an annual basis. To be honest, we don't do it as much as we'd like. And on the women's side, we've had, um, I'll say, the the good fortune of being able to have much more international exposure in, in camps. We're leaving on Saturday uh, with 12 athletes to go over to Europe and Sweden and we're going to have a, uh, a week of training prior to the competition. So uh, those are the kind of things that are going to make your athletes better and so it is something that we want to have happen and even if it doesn't happen on, an, uh, on a national basis at every tournament, We'd like to have, uh, as an example, off the Guelph tournament, we had a little bit of a regional get-together. Same thing off of SFU, had a little bit of a regional camp. Saskatoon just brought Jake Herbert in for a camp. So those kind of things are crucial. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I guess we'll get to the, the big reason why we're holding this. Uh, the 2014-2015 the national team program. Uh, the document with this program was just released a, a couple weeks ago and I know it kind of hit a lot of people off guard. Um, now part of that was because Fila obviously made these weight class changes kind of right in the middle of our season. Um, so obviously some changes had to happen in a very sh short notice. Uh, so to start, I was just wondering um, if you could maybe discuss what went into this program design. Uh, I know one question that we got from many people was exactly who was all involved in, in creating this program. Uh, any anything along those lines? Okay, um, I guess I'll start, Tanya, and maybe you can jump in if uh, mm -hmm. if you want. Uh, so a couple of things. We were hit uh, with a number. Of, Tanya's already alluded to in this whole Save Olympic Wrestling process. We we were hit with so many changes over the last six months. It, it's kind of made our head spin, and it's made it somewhat it's made somewhat our our old national team programs obsolete. Uh, the rules have changed dramatically. We can talk about those uh, as well. But also, uh, uh, come, <laughs> it's interesting. We are, we had a fall meeting with our international team coaches, which is all the coaches are of, of carded and world team athletes. Uh, we get, get together in the fall, and we do a, a analysis and wrap up of the world championships, and then we talk about what we want to have happen in the season going forward. So that's the first committee level is the international team committee. And anyone who is a coach of a, of a national team athlete is in attendance. And uh, it, basically, we move forward and, and start making recommendations that moves up the ladder. So at that point in time, we didn't know. There were still seven weight classes, and we were trying to make plans based on the status quo. Um, but in uh, mid-December, we were hit with the news that uh, the seven weight classes were now going to be 
eight weight classes moving forward. Six Olympic weight classes, which we knew we'd kind of got rumblings that in Rio there was going to be six freestyle, six Greco, and six women's weight classes. And now there's going to be the addition of these two non-Olympic weight classes. So we were kind of waiting for that news to come out. And the second it did, we tried to react. But uh, there's, there's been a, a ton of work uh, that's gone into trying to figure out and make sense of how our national team programs can run moving forward. As an example, our carding policy always said that your performance at tournaments was weight class specific. So any carding points you got <laughs> at a tournament uh, had to stay with you at that weight class. Well, if that weight class no longer exists, what does that mean? What do you do? So we had to discuss a lot of these issues, which included the SFU went off at one certain set of weight classes, and now those weight classes didn't exist anymore. Um, so uh, it started with Guelph, and um, moving forward, we tried to determine what the best, um, the best approach to um, uh, uh, athlete selection for our national teams would be. And this is one approach, I'll tell you this, Tanya and I, we were just down at a training camp in the United States, and we went to lunch with uh, Rich Bender and Les Gutches from the USA, and uh, we spent most of lunch just talking about the ins and outs of all these changes and how, how they were going to deal with it and how we were dealing with it and trying to exchange information. So I'll say one thing, though, that people automatically think that, well, that's great, we went from seven weight classes to eight weight classes, but I got to tell you, we didn't change our budget. So uh, uh, that's that's a 14% increase if we all of a sudden start sending uh, eight athletes to every tournament, uh, uh, World Championships, Pan American Championships, FISUs, uh, and, and the like. So uh, if we'd gotten a subsequent increase uh, in our funding, that would be great, but we didn't. So there's going to be some hard decisions. Uh, to be made, and um, again, at the crux of our 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 funding, it comes from Olympic performance. And so, one of the things uh, that Own the Pony has been very clear to us with is that uh, top priority uh, in all of our funding uh, must um, be utilized to to ensure our, our best possible Olympic performance in 2016. And so, some people won't like to hear that. Some people are ecstatic to hear that. It's, it's all a matter of perspective. So we're trying to do the best we can to figure out how to select these eight weight classes and how to ensure the quality of the program isn't compromised in any way. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, a lot of the, the questions we had from viewers had to do uh, with the, the non-Olympic weight classes. Uh, obviously because you know the the way the program was set out. Um, the one question I think we we had most was, what is the reasoning, or if you can give us some idea of why nationals is only going to be the Olympic weight classes, and then you're going to have the non-Olympic weight classes wrestled afterwards. If you could just give us some perspective on on where that decision came from. Yeah, just even before I go there, I just want to say, just so people get an idea, I got an email today that the Commonwealth Games have changed their weight classes. They were going to go with the sep seven old weight classes, but now they're going with the seven of the eight new weight classes. So now all of a sudden, 60 kilo women and 70 kilo men are not going to be competed at the Commonwealth Games. But the other seven are. So I don't know who decided that. There'll be another decision that some will be mad at, <laughs> mad at Canadian wrestling about. But that's an example of you know things are happening all the time and things are getting thrown at us and, and we're, we're trying to deal with them. So... The decision to have six weights. Do you want to take it, Tanya? Um, well, I'll just uh, um, like you know, there's the, the meetings that have been discussed um, with the um, high performance committee and um, and with just even the hired staff. Um, I mean, there's there are so many um, conversations and emails and decisions that are being thrown at us constantly and we're just trying to we try to really brainstorm our thoughts and ideas combined and um, to try to come up with the, the best possible solution at this point and um, so as as far as the the non-olympic weights not being wrestled at nationals I think the the main premise was that we wanted to make sure we had the best uh, team um, intern uh, team leading to the world championships and on our um, national program um, uh, to 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 find out like okay let's have these Olympic weights 
and and have the best possible competition and then from there um, we can wrestle them off the non-Olympic weights and again use the have those people that are wrestling in the Olympic weights um, be combined into that to get the po best possible team um, uh, for the world championships and the other international um, tournaments as well as we like Lee was mentioning we are only funded for the the Olympic weights um, through a carding system so that was another reason why it would have made it just a little bit easier and um, simplify things um, at the nationals and Lee if you want to kind of add to that I know that you've been involved in these processes a lot longer than I have and so I'm learning as we go um, but uh, yeah go ahead for sure I mean I can give a couple examples one is uh, uh, when we were talking with the Americans, they were saying, oh, well, the freestyle guys want to have all weights, all eight weights at nationals, and the Greco and the women want six. <laughs> and so the, the freestyle guys want to just have their, their, their world team selection be based on a tournament, and people go to the weight that they're in. Now, they may be the, uh, under different constraints, but I, I don't believe they are. Rich Bender was talking about the same pressure to fund the six Olympics uh, and then fund the others um, after the fact, but an example would be 74 kilos for the men in the United States. So if they just wrestle all eight weight classes and that's their selection, you might have a situation where Kyle Dake and Jordan Burroughs and these guys all wrestle off and one get a spot and then someone else goes 70 kilos. Whereas if they do it, 74 kilos all wrestle off and then later on there's a subsequent trial at 70 kilos, you know, they're thinking they might be able to have two world champions, you know, and they and they might, and actually that other person might have valuable experience winning a worlds or getting world championships experience. So there's lots of ways to look at it. I, I want people to understand this was not a flippant decision that we just did uh, uh, off the cuff. We talked about the pros and cons, and there was a lot of of debate. The other thing, Andy, I wanted to say, and I didn't quite cover it. In my first remark was the ITC is the first committee. But then it goes to a high performance committee, which includes athletes reps, official, medical, coaches rep. Uh, and then it goes from there to the executive, any decision. And then uh, if there's any issues, things can be brought to the board of directors. So that's the governance, pol or governance process that things like this document followed. It was created uh, with input from the international team committee. And then the coaching staff sat down um, with Vang, uh, our uh, VP technical. Um, we also had input from athletes reps and then it went to high performance committee and then the executive to ratify it. So that's kind of how it came forward. The six weight classes, it depends on the day. <laughs> Some days I think, yes, we'll get a true ranking of our, of our depth chart at those six Olympic weights if they're the only ones competed at. And then there's no argument over carding points because if we had all eight at the, at the nationals, essentially the people going in those non-Olympic weights are giving up the opportunity to be carded. If we have them somewhere else, then everyone will get in there. They'll have an opportunity to be carded, and then later on, we'd have an opportunity to wrestle off those additional weights. And and again, it may be better for our team, uh, our high performance team, long wise or uh, in the long term. But it's not necessarily. I I can see the downside of not having all eight at the nationals as well. Okay, thanks so much for the explanation. Uh... Hopefully that was satisfactory. If anyone still has any questions, again, feel free to, to message and uh, we can maybe get a little more in depth on certain certain points there. Uh, one other little question that I had, uh, I think it's I think I know the answer, but we'll let you explain. Uh, the men's wrestle off right now is scheduled to take off uh, take place at the top summit for the non Olympic weights, whereas the women's is for the at the Canada Cup. Uh, can you just explain the process behind that? Why isn't it all at the Canada Cup? Why is it not all at Tops? Okay, typically our wrestle-offs have been at Canada Cup, but because um, uh, at the Nat, well, we have a, we have two conflicts. We have one is we have a World Cup uh, for women's wrestling that's going to take place in Japan the weekend before the national championships, and so a number of our top athletes will be away at that event and will un be unable to compete at the national championships. Or if we were to mandate that, it wouldn't be very fair. I don't think we would have a have a uh, team at the World Cup. So essentially, um, that means that the men's nationals for those six weights will be the world team selection, and it'll be done at those six weights. And they'll only have the two weights to wrestle off. However, the women will have a full six Olympic weight wrestle off at the top seminars. And so that's why it's a little bit different. Um, 
Now, the six Olympic weights will be wrestled off at tops, with uh, including the World Cup team members and um, the uh, national championship uh, people. And uh, we had a, a great amount of debate about this. Uh, look, there are four ways we could have gone with this. We could have, and, and I asked originally to move the nationals, um, move the date of nationals, not the, the location, but the date of the nationals. And it was seen as, as too short a notice and not feasible. So I asked about canceling the women's, senior women's portion of the nationals so that we could have one tournament and everyone would be in there and it would be fair. Um, and that wasn't seen as a realistic um, option either. So we had to determine whether we're going to just have a straight wrestle off or a full tournament. And after great debate, we discussed that uh, for the women, we with these new weight classes and moving around and the depth of the field, that we just needed to have a, a, a full tournament. And so that, that was the decision made there. Whether you like it or not, uh, there was a lot of consideration put into it. And uh, so the non-Olympic weight classes will not be selected at TOPS. They'll be selected at the Canada Cup. But all of our Olympic weight classes need to be done by TOPS because we start our karting cycle. And uh, if we put it off till the Canada Cup, there's going to be a three-month period where athletes aren't getting karting and, and we need to get them the support they need when they need it. So that's, I mean, there are a lot of factors that, that play into it, but uh, th that's some of the factors that have played into this decision. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Uh, I guess a, a pretty good segue, we mentioned the Women's World Cup. Uh, that's kind of the next big uh, international event for, for Canada. Uh, can you maybe just give us an idea of what the lineup is looking like at the moment? Do we know a full roster yet, or...? Uh, yeah, so uh, essentially, again, this was um, one of the things that was brought up to me is, should we attend the World Cup um, a as a team? And essentially, I want people to understand that from my perspective as a national coach and a, and a program developer, the World Cup is the team competition for the World Championships. So if you win the World Cup, you're the number one team in the world, and it's a, it's a dual meet format, and it's the top eight ranked teams in the world that get to go to this. And um, uh, I can tell you, and Tanya, I'll get you to talk about it in a second, but I can tell you this is one of the most valuable events that we get to go to because when I'm sitting in that meeting with Owen the podium, they're asking me, okay, if you're going to be on the podium in Rio, who do you have to beat? And I look at the results at the, the World Championships, and I look at, well, number one team is Japan, number two team is Mongolia, uh, USA is in there, so we know them. Uh, then there's China, Kazakhstan. There's a lot of these countries that we don't typically get to compete against, and we do get to keep, compete against them as teams at the World Cup. So it's very valuable for tough matches for athletes. So I'm really quite adamant that if, if we really want to be the best, that, it, that it's an important event for us to attend, and it's prestigious, and we're going to go to Japan, which is, for women's wrestling, it's like going to Iran for male wrestling. Um, so, uh, anyways, that, that's why I believe, believe this is an important event and, and why all this headache happens, you know. Uh, we, we do so well at the, Nash, at the Worlds that we're mandated to go to this, and, and I, it's not just that we're mandated, I think it's important for our program. Tony, can you speak to that a little bit? Do you think, uh, I mean, your, your perspective on that? Yeah, um, World Cup, um, it was like during the season for me was probably the, the number two best competition for me um, as far as just being able to get the opportunity to compete against the best in my weight class and um, just that whole environment, that competitive environment with your team and country versus country, it's, um, it's just, it's one, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's one of the most amazing competitions that you can be a part of as an athlete. And I know for myself, there was there were times like in my season or during the World Championships or the Olympics where I didn't meet up with some of the um, my main competitors that I needed to compete against, like prior to say leading to a games or or the following season to the World Championships. And so it was like my my goal to reach some of these top athletes. Like for example, China in 2008 was the silver medalist, and I never met up with her in the draw. But that following year, I got to wrestle her at the World Cup in the finals, China versus Canada for the finals. So it was, you know, those things were were really important to me as an athlete, and also for for the team in general to to keep our team involved in, at the international level, to be exposed to it, and um, it, it it's only um, in my in my opinion. Um, that's something like it's it's very um, 
uh, related to high performance and gaining like just that extra edge on our competitors and for ourselves leading to the, the following se or that coming season. Yeah. So Andy, you had asked about the lineup and I can tell you uh, uh, it was a little more confusing this year <laughs> because what we've typically done in the past is we've, we've offered our, our national champions the number one right of refusal to go and represent at the World Cup. And so uh, with the changing of uh, weight classes, we had a little bit of debate over uh, who should get the right to represent at different weight classes. And so uh, uh, we've kind of uh, ended up coming to a compromise. So I'll, I'll give you the lineup. Um, at 48 kilos, we have uh, Jessica McDonald and Natasha Campbell are going to both go to uh, Japan and split matches at the event. Uh, which left at 53 kilos, our second-ranked wrestler is Vanessa Brown, and she's been offered the position there. At 55 kilograms, uh, our national champion is Jill Glaze, and she was offered the position to go uh, and compete there. 58 kilograms was offered to our 59-kilogram world team member, which is uh, Braxton Papadopoulos, uh, which left us a 60-kilogram weight class, which was offered to... Michelle Fazari, uh, who is our number two at 59. Uh, 63 kilograms, uh, Justine Bouchard uh, was our national champion. She was offered the 63 kilogram position. 69 was offered to Dorothy Yeats, uh, who is our 67 kilo number one ranked wrestler. And then finally, uh, 75 kilos offered to Erica Weep. And so that's the lineup going into Japan. We've got eight athletes going, or sorry, nine athletes going. Uh, uh, at the eight weight classes and uh, I'm excited about Tanya's going to come with me as a, a coach and I'm very excited about uh, the prospects of of our competition there and um, it's the same weekend as CIS but I sure hope that people are able to to tune in and, and watch it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned this a little bit, uh, Japan's hosting the Women's World Cup. Uh, it's a, a pretty big spot for women's wrestling. Uh, can you maybe just give us an idea of what to expect? Japan, it's a, a pretty important time to promote the sport. Uh, what do you think Japan offers for this competition to maybe showcase the sport of women's wrestling? Tanya, why don't you take this one? Um, well, it, it has been in Tokyo before, um, and it's, it's pretty cool to um, be in a place that... Um, is so supportive for women's wrestling um, and just hype in general towards athletes and um, so they always put on a good show um, it definitely will have a lot of media attention for our girls and um, just it will get them pumped up for um, what it's like to be in like a stadium setting um, competition and some of them that um, haven't been at the world championships or games that sort of thing it's uh, it's it's kind of a, a good way to um, have them perform um, at center stage and um, uh, against uh, the number one team. Um, hopefully we will get to meet them and if not then we are still competing against uh, the very best in the world. And so yeah, I think it's it's a, going to be a great event, uh, pretty exciting and then also for um, 2020 the next Olympics uh, after Rio um, that will be in Tokyo as well so I know that will be coordinated into that. Uh, just Japan is one there's been 12 Olympic medals in female wrestling in the last three Olympics, four, four, and four, and Japan's won eight of them. So we're talking about the power, premier power team in women's wrestling. Uh, in in uh, Athens, we were third as a team. Japan was first. In Beijing, we were second as a team. Japan was first. And then again in London, we were third as a team. Japan was first. So everyone's trying to dethrone these guys. Um, but but that's why that there's so you know there's so much media attention. When we come into the airport, we're often met by media people, and uh, uh, Tanya is a pretty big star over there herself. And uh, it's kind of nice to see just the appreciation of our sport and of women's wrestling. It just there's nowhere where it's it's held in high regard. Awesome, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so we, we did kind of touch on this a little bit earlier about the uh, Commonwealth Games. We just heard that there's going to be they're going to be using the new weights, but I'm pretty sure you said they're going to use seven of the eight new weights. Is yeah. that the? Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I guess the uh, the other question then uh, was how will that team now be selected? Uh, so I'm assuming it's just going to be offered to the number ones at those weights. But it, it, again, so uh, <laughs> this is 
put me on the spot and putting us on the spot, but essentially, yes, I would say for sure the Olympic, uh, the six Olympic weights would be a, a straight slam dunk, and they would be they'd be a straight transfer over. Now, there's one non-Olympic weight uh, that will need to be selected, and on the guy's side, I think don't think it's an issue because that will be wrestled off at tops. And uh, one of the things with games is you need to have your roster in well ahead of time. Although we did manage to get Corey Jarvis in on, like, I have about a week's notice last time for the Commonwealth Games, but it's not not a typical thing. Uh, but basically, so I think the seven uh, weight classes on the men's side will be very clear. Uh, on the women's side, if we're not able to wrestle that 60 kilo uh, female weight class off until the Canada Cup, uh, that's essentially weeks before. So um, we're going to need to talk to the Commonwealth Games group and potentially have uh, um, a couple people ready to go and see uh, you know um, if we're able to do that and and uh, and, and use utilize that trials just because it is essentially that's the start of July is the Canada Cup and the Commonwealth Games is the end of July at 29th to the 31st so uh, logistically sometimes the deadlines on on having a team entered or not uh, could be an issue and if it is an issue and they won't allow us to have that wrestle off um, stand, then we may have to look at a situation where like the number two fifty eight kilo uh, uh, is offered the position or you know that's going to be another decision where we're going to have to look at if there's two people, say the number two sixty three and the number two fifty eight who could make sixty kilos, maybe we need to have a challenge match there. I will say this, and I think our whole philosophy and our whole staff is you know, one of the things um, we're trying to say here, and the, the reason why I wanted to do this Google Hangout, Andy, is is to get across to people that we're trying to do the right thing for our national team program, and uh, when in doubt, we are trying to have people compete for spots. We also we know the Olympic Games are a couple years away, and there's a lot of work to do, and nobody's penciled in at this point in time. Everyone. Everyone, and I've said this to the, the women on our team, and I know Guy is saying it to the men, that you know we want you to go out and earn your spot and not be afraid to compete and and, uh, and do what you have to do to make these teams. So, yeah, again, this is a, a, a reaction, um, but the Commonwealth Games having seven weights is a great thing. It is. All right, excellent. Uh, I think... Oh, go ahead, Sorry, Tony. I'm just going to say a few things, too. Um, just to clarify something, I know Lee had mentioned that the World Cup is the same time as CIs, um, but that's actually not true, right, Lee? Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm talking yeah. about Sweden. So, Sweden is, I'm leaving for Sweden. Sweden is the same yeah. time as CIs. So I did want to clarify that. And um, also, you. if you guys are wanting to um, see these documents, and if you haven't seen them, like, um, up up close and personal, you can go onto the website under the policies um, uh, com part um, to the link or link onto the policy section and both the men's and women's um, national team, senior national team programs will be up and very shortly the junior program and Feel like Cadet will also be. Okay, yeah, and I know for a fact too the documents are under right under the national championships link uh, under events as well. So okay, looking, great. If you're looking for stuff uh, regarding nationals, you'll see the national team program as well. Uh, that was really it for the the questions that were sent in. Um, you just mentioned Cadet Junior. Uh, maybe we can just talk a little bit about that because as of right now, the weights are staying the same. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where that's going to go in the future. Who knows? I'm sure eventually they might change uh, based on what we've seen. Uh, do you have anything you can add about those programs and what we're looking to do? Or is it still just a waiting game to see if they change? Or um, Well, as of now, um, it hasn't changed. And But like we said before, we, we nev you never know um, what can happen in the next few months. But um, I'm hoping that, you know, things will stay as is for at least this season. And... Um, and we can move move forward with that. Um, as far as the junior and um, cadet program, um, that finalized program isn't in place yet. It will be very shortly. Um, but um, I'm pretty excited about some of the things that um, we hope to do this this year, and um, get it our our um, cadet and, and juniors involved more at the international levels, um, both at training camps and competitions, um, earning their spot just like. Um, 
Lee was mentioning, um, trying to to help them develop um, to uh, <coughs> performance and and to to be um, you know contenders at the international level. Maybe not this season, but um, that's what our hopes are: is to you know let's develop our athletes to to be able to be at least somewhat competitive with our international um, competitors. And um, yeah, so we need to kind of start from scratch in certain ways, in my opinion, and and I'm hoping to um, be able to push our athletes and and our and um, and develop a program, have our program in place that um, asks a little bit more. And um, I know that it's kind of tough at that level because we don't have a ton of funds. Um, so we want to make sure that these funds are used wisely and that um, our our athletes are, are gaining as much experience as possible. Okay, and, and I guess in that note as well, uh, I don't know if this is, has been thought out or if there's a certain policy in place already, but our junior senior nationals are held at the same time. Uh, we obviously have some individuals that wrestle both. Braxton, I think, is the, the one big example there. Um, do we know how exactly that's going to work? Like, will the juniors who typically weigh in the day before Will they be weighing in at the lowest weight between the two? Do we know how that's going to work yet? Yes. Um, yes. Go ahead, Lee. Uh, well, the plan is, and, and this is the difficult part, is that uh, with the way it is, um, the athletes are going to be asked to make the lower of the weight classes. So if you're competing at 67 and then 69, you're going to you're going to have to make 67. If you're competing at 58 and 59, then you're going to have to be asked to make 58, which unfortunately is the day after. <laughs> so you're actually dropping an extra kilo the day before you're competing for, as a junior. So there's a ton of holes in these things, and uh, it's really frustrating that Fila didn't. And I, I don't want to pass the buck here. We're all part of this, but that they didn't change the junior weights as well to kind of mirror those because it does create some issues uh, in terms of running programming and and for our best athletes competing at one weight and then competing at another weight. But uh, at the end of the day, um, we understand that this year is going to be a challenge and we're going to have to battle through it on some different fronts. And so um, uh, the example of Braxton there, well, she's going to be at World Cup, so that's going to also um, impact that as well, that, that tournament there, so she, she will have a different opportunity. Um, but there, there's a lot of work to be done and, and our, like I say, our national team programs and policies need to be changed and we are working to change them dramatically to, to create the most optimal system uh, for, our, for our national teams. And I can tell you my experience is that it's very different. It's done differently around the world. USA has a couple tournaments every year. We usually have one nationals. USA has a nationals and a world team trials. Japan has a tournament in December, then a tournament later in, in the winter, and they utilize that as two of their selections. So it can be done a number of ways, and I want people to understand that um, we're trying to do the, the best that we can for wrestling in our, in our own country, and uh, uh, it's not always easy. And that's the other thing. The number one complaint I get is there's not enough financial support to the athletes and to the programs, and it's not easy. That's one of the big things I hope we can do, and why I wanted again us to do this, Andy, is is start building our brand, getting the word out there, having people follow our athletes, understand our our vision and our whole um, purpose, and take pride in it as one big national program. And if we can do that, you know what, like you look at the Save Olympic Wrestling, how in the U.S. they were able to get such great financial support within hours of the decision. It's just staggering how much support that that sport uh, or the sport down there get gained. And so I'm just thinking like if we had great, great economic, um, you know, uh, support, we wouldn't be worried so much about some of these other things. And so we have to bring in more support than just government support into our, into Canada, Canada wrestling. All right. Well, I definitely agree on that front. Uh, it's definitely something we're working on. Uh, I hope this helps in some way. I, I'd actually like to make this a, a regular thing we do. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying it. If you have any people you would like to see on the show in the future, I know I'd definitely like to get Gia on uh, when he's back from Cuba. Um, but even athletes, I'm more than willing to have them on. Uh, so, you know, always tweet us, give us a shout. We can maybe uh, arrange some more of these in the near future. Maybe make it a, a weekly thing, uh, get the athletes' names out there. 
Yeah. Uh, just one more question, actually, I guess, before we uh, will sign off. Uh, there has been a couple of people who have asked even about Greco-Roman in Canada. Uh, I know it is mentioned in the documents as a potential carding thing based on kind of international results. Uh, I guess the, the questions are, I know last time Commonwealth Games we did send a team to India. Uh, is that the current plan this Commonwealth Games? If, if you know, I know it's more the men's program at the moment. Um, Greco is not included in the Commonwealth program in uh, Scotland. Okay, so it's not even included at all. Not included. It, it's actually freestyle and women's, and so uh, essentially that changes that that part of the program. Um, but yes, it, it, it is a it is a challenge to again. So we're trying to we're trying to look at um, high performance versus development and long term development, and so. There, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on on that side of things if we're going to come into actually being a nation that wants to to do two styles of wrestling, yeah. and um, it, it, there are a lot of, uh, like I say, uh, financial roadblocks, but also uh, even cultural roadblocks in Canada where people don't really understand or support the that side of our sport the way that they could. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, so just to conclude, any final thoughts, Tanya? Anything you'd like to say or any other things you'd like to get out there? Uh, well, thanks, Andy, for having us um, on the show. Um, I think this is a great way for us to be able to communicate um, as a country and also have other people watch and from across the world maybe and uh, kind of see what we're doing um, in, in our organization. And I'm constantly learning in my new position, and so... For people out there, feel free to contact me if you have any questions um, or comments about um, the upcoming programs and um, and any suggestions are are welcomed. Um, also, if you just again like have any uh, want to know anything more about the the national programs, it's also on the news feed, um, the news story, and under the uh, events um, section. So. Um, take a look. I know that some of it is it's uh, pretty thorough and in the large document, but there are areas there that you might want to have clarified a little bit more. Hey, Lee? Yeah, I just want to say I think Tanya and I are both open to being um, approached and questioned and, and even debated with it in different levels. Uh, you know, I, there are a lot of critics out there, and again, I sometimes think they look at things from the wrong perspective. They look at they're not looking at what we're saying. They're looking at what they, what, you know, what, how it's going to affect their one athlete or their their program. And and it's really we're doing the. Uh, um, I'll tell you, tell you, we're trying our to do a diligent job, and uh, I think we've done uh, a great job in building our team. I'm really excited to have Tanya and Gia on board uh, in this process. Uh, we are. Uh, three national coaches, and uh, we have an executive director, a high performance manager, and an office manager. So we have six staff compared to USA's. I, I just looked; I think it was 32 staff members uh, on their board, and and uh, I think we're doing a pretty great job, to be honest. Uh, but it, it can always be better, and um, there are so many valuable inputs out there, and that's why you know I, I want people to feel feel welcome to. Um, to come to the table with ideas uh, moving forward. And um, I'm just excited to be part of this process. I want to do a quick shout out. I'm wearing my uh, Team Canada hockey jersey tonight because, uh, you know, we're all part of a bigger team. And uh, I'm wearing this because I have a bet with Terry Steiner, the U.S. <laughs> national coach, uh, on our men's hockey game this uh, coming uh, week. And so the loser is going to have to wear the other team's jersey at the World Cup in uh, Japan. Last time he had to wear uh, our jersey, obviously, so I'm pretty excited about it. But, uh, I think it's safe uh, to say he's going to be wearing it again. He's going to yeah, be wearing it again. Yeah, so uh, uh, anyways, it, it's all fun. Uh, we're, we're working hard, but you know what? We're, we're, we're going to have fun with this too. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for both of you joining me here. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the show. I'm hoping questions were answered. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to know, like both Tanya Lee said, you can contact them at any time. You can contact me. Um, I would love to make this a regular thing. So if you have any suggestions for anyone you'd like on the show or just topics to be discussed, anytime tweet me, Facebook me. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, on that note, thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Lee, for joining us. There's and a new uh, website that's going to be on, on um, 
what's the uh, that's gonna gonna come out right away, and uh, we're hoping to get it done by the nationals, and we're hoping that's a great source of information and promotion for our program. Perfect. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to a new uh, Canada Wrestling website, so we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Uh, we're gonna sign off, and I'll hope to see you again soon. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye guys. Bye. See ya.